Uh, sir, if is if it's OK, I'd just like to inform you we'd be recording this session as we have a mandatory university policy. Um, also, will you be comfortable if we upload this session on YouTube on our YouTube channel? If it's yes, okay. no problem at all. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. OK, let me now officially welcome the past president of the International Academy of Family Lawyers. Uh, William Longridge, who works in the Charles Russell uh, firm in London. The topic of today's lecture is common law and civil law jurisdiction in the context of financial provision of divorce. Uh, this will be interesting for uh, many uh, Jindal students, I hope. Uh, our privilege and pleasure to have an experienced lawyer, a practitioner, William Longridge, with us. Uh, so the format is as usual in our lectures. It will be a 40 minutes talk with followed by questions and answer sessions. Again, uh, welcome William to the Jindal Society of International Law, which is part of the Center for the Study of United Nations. Anki did all the work <laughs> for, for this series and I am very happy that we have such enthusiastic students who created the Jindal Society and um, your, your time starts uh, your 40 minutes from now on. I hope some students may still join. Some of them have finished classes but others did not so there might be more students coming up but as we are scheduled we need to go ahead as planned. Thank you. Very good. Uh, thank you very much indeed, um, Professor and Ankit. Also, thank you for inviting me to this. Um, so shall we just actually move on to the next slide by way of introduction? Thank you very much. So really what I want to talk to, about, to you about today are the differences in quite a specific area between common law and civil law jurisdictions. And the reason I want to talk about this is that this is quite a major element of international family law practice because it's a struggle sometimes what are the key differences between the systems we need to know these differences in order to have this international practice and in order to understand the issues that exist internationally so what are the key considerations now of course england and wales common law jurisdiction is our approach, is our system a little bit too cumbersome? Is it too onerous? Is it, is it too long-winded compared with many of the civil law jurisdictions? Now, it's become a bit of a cliche to say that London is the divorce capital of the world. Uh, and in a way, it's a bit silly, but they say this all the time. And this is partly because Divorce is very big business in London. And one of the reasons divorce is big business is that we have, well, obviously we have a lot of rich people living in London, which sometimes makes divorces more complicated. We have a lot of international families living in London, which means that international considerations are very much to the fore. But really what that means is that it's more onerous for the richer party because we're much more thorough about finding out about what's in the assets. We're much more thorough than the civil law jurisdictions about doing that. We have cross-examination in hearings, which civil law jurisdictions very often do not have. We have different duties to the court, which civil law jurisdictions do not have. So it's the financially better off party that is scared of London, which is one of the reasons it's called the divorce capital of the world. And of course, the awards made to the financially weaker parties are large, sometimes very large, although the biggest divorce case that I think possibly the biggest divorce uh, result ever in a court was in fact in Geneva, in a case that I was involved with where the wife got five and a half billion dollars or Swiss francs, which is similar. And um, of course, it was appealed and so on. And the end result was rather different from that. But apart from that particular case, we're talking about very significant sums of money being dealt with in London. So just I talk about resolution. This is the organisation 
which really looks after solicitors who are dealing with family law issues. And in terms of membership of resolution, there's more than a thousand solicitors in London alone, 6,500 nationally dealing with these family law issues. But of course, there are also far more than that who do some family law, but are not members of that organisation. So really, this is big business for us. And that's quite different from many civil law jurisdictions and the way that they approach it, as you will see. So let's just move on to the next slide. Let's just talk a little bit about the background between common law and civil law jurisdictions. So common law is, the idea is that it stems from Henry II's attempt in the 12th century to provide a consistent approach to legal remedies throughout the whole of the kingdom, an approach common to the whole land. Civil law countries have a system which developed from Roman law, from the Emperor Justinian's Corpus Juris Civilis, which of course, in a sense, the modern version of that, modern manifestation of that is the Napoleonic Code, which is adopted in many civil law countries. So the idea is common law countries look at things with more discretion. Civil law countries look at things with more certainty and through legislation to a greater extent than through custom and legal precedent, which is how common law countries look at thing, things. Now, we had a really interesting case called Miller and Miller and McFarlane and McFarlane, and I, I haven't written it on this slide, but it's um, but I'll mention it again in a few slides so that you will have the reference to that. I mean, the background to this is what <laughs> is a typical case where Mrs. Miller was only married for three years. She didn't have any children, but she still got five million pounds. Mrs. McFarlane had a longer marriage. She was a lawyer. She gave up her job in order to look after the children. Uh, Mr. McFarlane was earning £750,000 a year net as an accountant, and she got £250,000 a year maintenance. This is why people regard England, London as being the divorce capital of the world. Anyway, the, the facts uh, of those cases are not as relevant as what the House of Lords, now the Supreme Court, said as a result of the case that appeared before them. They said, do you know what? When you're looking at finances on divorce, you have to look at compensation, sharing, and needs. And we said, hang on a sec, only the word needs appears in our statute. Compensation and sharing don't even appear. So that's just an example of how common law jurisdictions allow matters to develop through case law rather than through statute, which in some ways makes it less predictable and is quite muddling and actually makes it more difficult to advise our clients. So the English speaking world is in a sense regarded as the world of common law. Um, and of course, we are very different from the systems influenced mainly by uh, the Roman law, the Napoleonic Code, and so on, such as mainland Europe, Central and South America, and many other jurisdictions. Um, so if I can have the next slide, please. Now, this is really quite uh, an important point for us to bear in mind to do with the matrimonial property regimes. This is something we have to consider between various different jurisdictions. And this is what you'll see when I when I have a a client coming into the office for the first time. I might, might be, let's say, um, a French woman, as we had once. Um, she came in and she said, oh, my husband's um, going to divorce me in France. And um, I don't know whether that's better for me or whether I should just issue divorce proceedings here in England. There is such a big difference perhaps, between how things are dealt with in England and how things are dealt with in France, which is what I'm going to be talking about to some extent. Now, the big clear difference is that in civil law jurisdictions, you have these things called matrimonial property regimes, which are created when you get married. They may be immediate regimes, they may be deferred regimes. The point is, it's something which is created on marriage. And the definition could be 
for example, what I've set out here, a system of property ownership between spouses created on a marriage automatically by operation of law. So the law in many of these civil law jurisdictions treats the property as being owned in a particular manner. It doesn't matter whose name it's in, it's owned in a particular manner because they're married. Now, typically, and of course they vary from country to country, typically the default regime is community property, which essentially means that all the assets created during the marriage are held jointly and equally. This is normally the default regime. There are very few jurisdictions where the default regime is, is the separation of goods. The other way of holding property, property, and of course there are variations on this, and I'm talking generally, but a separation of goods regime is where the assets belong to the party in whose name they are. So really, if we're talking about civil law jurisdictions in these countries, the role of a prenuptial agreement or marriage contract, as they more normally call them, is to convert the community property regime into a separation of goods regime. Now, of course, some people argue that in England, we actually have a kind of community property regime, because after the case of White and White in uh, in 2001, where the House of Lords said, do you know what? This business of dealing with divorce cases on the basis of needs has got to stop. Why shouldn't what's been created during the marriage be divided equally? And this was a new concept to us because, of course, that's what's done in civil law regimes to some extent, or civil law jurisdictions. And so when people say, particularly people in civil law countries, they say, well, you've got a kind of community property system because the starting point under English law is actually 50% of what's been created. But in fact, we don't really have that because we have a system whereby we depart all the time through discretion, this common law concept of discretion. Um, actually, can you move on to the next slide? So talking about what happens in England in divorce, very different from, for example, what happens in France. So we don't have property regimes. We have the Matrimonial Causes Act, and we have these factors which are taken into consideration. These are all the things that the court needs to look at in exercising its discretion. So things like the party's needs, the standard of living, the length of the marriage, their age, all these things. Oh, well, the first consideration is for the needs of the child, by the way. But all these considerations are in a sense ignored when the division of property comes to take place in civil law jurisdictions, because they're just dealing with the property regime as it already exists. And this is really a very different thing. And one of the main differences that we have to deal with it. So the 75 Act, sorry, the 73 Act here, the section 25 factors do not apply to property regimes. So I've set out here the reference to this case of white and white, which decided that we should deal with things on an equal basis. And that's the fair way to deal with it. And the way that we'd been dealing with it before was unfair. And that's one of the most important cases we have in uh, English law in dealing with assets in the event of divorce. Now, uh, for the French courts, really the main function when it's dealing with property and assets is to put into effect the matrimonial regime. And it's quite separate from the point of maintenance. So this is just something that really has to be borne in mind. And people go as far as to say that the impossible existence of a matrimonial regime in common law countries um, exists. And it's really been commented on that it's like a child trying desperately to fit a square 
into a round hole without changing the shapes. And I'm going to be talking about that in a while when it comes to the European instruments that we've been having to deal with. So could I have the next slide, please? So prenuptial agreements. Now, this has really changed in common law jurisdictions. When I started in practice 36 years ago in, in the same firm, in fact, prenuptial agreements hardly existed. They were seen as contrary to public policy. They were, of course, always popular in civil law jurisdictions, because in civil law jurisdictions, it was a way of avoiding the matrimonial regime, the default matrimonial regime. So rather than saying everything will be shared, they had marriage contracts to say, no, it won't be shared. It's actually going to remain in the names of the parties who have them at the moment or who earn the money or who have it transferred into their names or whatever it might be. So they were always used in civil law jurisdictions, but they were slow to take off in common law jurisdictions. But they're now very popular in many common law jurisdictions, including England. When I say England, I don't mean the UK because things are very different in Scotland and different in Northern Ireland. So England essentially means England and Wales, which have the same legal uh, system, have the same legislative system. So it's important to bear in mind, prenuptial agreements are not contracts. They're not binding on the court. They're not contractually binding. They are contracts in civil law jurisdictions, hence they're very often called marriage contracts. And that's a very important distinction. I've mentioned here the case of Radmacher and Granatino. It's quite an interesting case. I mean, the background to it is moderately interesting. It's not so relevant to the outcome. But um, in this case, it was a French man marrying a German woman. She was an heiress. Um, he was a pretty well off banker. He had a very good job. There wasn't really any financial disclosure, which is perfectly common, of course, in civil law jurisdictions. There was no negotiation about the terms or the legal advice obtained or anything like that. And the agreement made no financial provision whatever for the husband. But uh, in this particular case, when they got divorced, the Supreme Court used this as an opportunity to say, actually, the existence of that prenuptial agreement, essentially that marriage contract, even though it's not entered into according to the rules that we would normally apply in England, the husband will not be held to it, but it will reduce his entitlement. And the Supreme Court then gave a very detailed uh, resume of the rules that apply to prenuptial agreements. We've, we found actually extremely helpful. So essentially what the court said was the court should give effect to a nuptial agreement that is freely entered into by each party with a full appreciation of its implications, unless in the circumstances prevailing, it would not be fair to hold the parties to their agreement. So it's all to do with fairness. And how do they look at what's fair? Well, there are certain rules first of all. There mustn't be any undue pressure. It must be signed at least 28 days before the wedding. There should be independent legal advice for each party, full financial disclosure, and it's got to be fair. That means that the financially weaker party has got to have enough to deal with her needs or his or her needs. And if those needs are not dealt with, the court will simply not necessarily ignore the prenuptial agreement, but they will make provision which is not set out in that prenuptial agreement. So that test has been extremely important. Now, in the civil law jurisdictions, and I've put here on the slide, what are the requirements for entering into a marriage contract? Well, they don't need to have independent legal advice. They can both be advised by the same notary. There's no requirement for full disclosure of assets. Uh, it can be done very close to the time of the wedding. Certainly doesn't have to be 28 days in advance. Uh, and they don't actually have to provide for the needs of the party. 
And then they don't normally deal with maintenance either. As it happens, prenuptial agreements now can specify where the maintenance should be dealt with. But most prenuptial agreements in most countries, Germany being an exception, they will not deal with maintenance. It's just to do with property because of the existence of these regimes. So let's just go on to the next slide and talk about how things are dealt with in a typical civil law jurisdiction. Uh, so next slide. Thanks very much. So I'm just talking here about the procedure in France. Now, in France, where there's no marital uh, contrat de mariage, no prenuptial agreement, no marital agreement signed, the default matrimonial regime is uh, réduite uh, aux aquais. There should be an X on the O there for those of you that know French. Sorry, that was missed off. Uh, so that's essentially a community property regime. Uh, and, a, and a marriage contract would have converted that if it had been entered into, into a separation de bien, a separation of goods uh, regime. Now, in France, and we will talk a little bit more about this, there's no final hearing on the financial consequences of the divorce, really. Uh, and what the court will do is they normally have this thing called a prestation compensatoire, which means it's a, usually a lump sum, which the financially weaker party gets in lieu of maintenance. That's the element where the court has some jurisdiction. And this is why when parties come in to see me, so we had a case, a well-known case, which is reported called Clamours. Um, when the wife came into our office and said that her husband was going off to France on the same day to divorce there, the difference between what she would have got in France and what she would have got in England was really important. And because she'd been in England for 28 days with him, they'd moved over for his job. She was entitled to get a divorce in England, but because they were both French, he was entitled to issue divorce proceedings in France. And first in time, under the uh, the EU, the European Union legislation at the time, meant that first in time seized the jurisdiction. So it was quite a tense moment. Who was going to be first in time? As it happens, they both issued divorce proceedings at the same time. And this was a really interesting uh, case, which lasted for a year, just to find out which country was going to be dealing with this divorce. Anyway, the whole thinking behind this was it made such a difference. So she got about 10 million pounds. She would never have got that if the divorce had taken place in France, because eventually it was found that the English court had the jurisdiction. And that's partly because it's much more thorough. So really, the difference between the two is that in France, a notary is normally appointed just to deal with the regime, to deal with the property. Uh, and in England, it could be days of discussion and argument. And in France, it's normally dealt with on paper. And in England, it's dealt with much more by way of traditional cross-examination, advocacy, and so on, for which there's very, very little opportunity in France. And remember, the courts in France have no discretion, discretion on the division of the community property, even though they may have some discretion in terms of what goes into the community property. But they don't have any discretion essentially on how it's divided. They only have discretion in terms of the allocation of the prestation compensatoire, which is the maintenance figure. Uh, so next slide, please. Now, this is a really interesting element, which I'm, I find it a struggle to deal with in terms of my dealings with other lawyers. And that's because we expect in common law jurisdictions that lawyers will tell us the truth. And that's because they're under an obligation to tell us the truth and they're under an obligation to tell the court the truth. This is not the same in civil law jurisdictions. Now, that sounds a bit harsh. And it's not a criticism of the civil law jurisdictions because we have a lot of elements that can be criticised about the common law jurisdictions as well. There's absolutely no question about that. But, for example, 
in the civil law jurisdictions, there is no duty of full and frank disclosure. I say there's no duty. There's a sort of general expectation that people will tell the truth. But there are no adverse consequences if people do not tell the truth. And it's quite difficult to get to the bottom of somebody's resources and somebody's financial situation. Now, for example, in France, there is this thing called uh, Déclaration sur l'honneur, which is where each party sets out their assets and their resources. And if you can show that the individual lied in that, then actually the the courts have, uh, the courts in France, for example, have actually developed a system whereby the person who's lied can be penalised by having to pay out more money. But look, in the common law jurisdictions, our first duty is to the court. You can't mislead the court. So if a client says to you, I've got a yacht in the south of France, but I don't want it to go on my schedule of assets, you have to stop acting for them if they insist, because you cannot put in a schedule of assets that is incomplete. In particular, for example, clients will often say, look, um, I'll come on to this in a moment more, but the clients say, look, I had, um, I had a million pounds, but I've transferred it to my cousin. That's not good enough because we cannot simply say to the court that that million pounds no longer exists for the purpose of the divorce pot because the cousin is very likely holding that money on what we would call resulting trust for the husband because the beneficial owner of that money is in fact the husband, even if it's in the name of a third party. But in a civil law jurisdiction, we would never really be able to get to the bottom of that because they don't have the questionnaires and they don't necessarily have the same attitude towards um, assets that are not held in the names of the parties. But the main issue is this question of the duty to the court. If the lawyer we're dealing with in the civil law jurisdiction isn't necessarily under an obligation to tell us the truth, but we are under an obligation to tell the truth. It can be really difficult. And that's something essential for people to know. When I'm lecturing to American lawyers on this subject, they simply cannot understand that these differences exist between different countries and different jurisdictions in developed countries. So that is something very important to consider. Could I have the next slide, please? Um, let's see evidence and argument. Now, this is this is a point that I've touched on already here, because uh, what I don't want to do is be accused of just saying that uh, things are better in common law jurisdictions and they're unfair in civil law jurisdictions, because that is frankly unfair. There are many advantages to the civil law jurisdictions. One of the advantages is clarity. It's easier to advise your clients. One of the advantages is that people understand when they get married, that these are the rules that they're getting married into. They know what it's about. People don't have to spend a great deal of money in the, con in the context of getting divorced because the answer is very often relatively clear because these rules exist. In a civil law, in a common law jurisdiction like ours, where it's more uncertain, we really struggle in dealing with these matters cheaply sometimes because there are so many possibilities by way of an outcome. Let's just look at these key differences. So I say to my friends in France, if you have a final hearing on divorce to deal with finances, how does it normally pan out? How many days do you have in court? And they say the hearing normally lasts for seven minutes. This is what it says in statute. If you know the judge, you'll get half an hour. If you know the judge really well, you'll get an hour. In England, two days pretty much minimum. Six weeks, not unusual in big cases. Completely unheard of in France. Absolutely no way. And what happens at these hearings? No, no chance of advocacy in France, maybe clarification of a couple of points in the seven minute period, 
Here it's opening arguments, examination in chief, cross-examination, submissions further. Everything's done 10 times. Frankly, it's done too much. We often know the result at the beginning of the case, but we still go through this ridiculous rigmarole. We have a whole potential team of solicitors, barristers, experts, day after day, which sometimes can be stultifyingly boring, particularly for the judge, I'm afraid. Bundles are very limited in most civil law jurisdictions, just a few pages of documents. We used to have enormous bundles in England. I mean, it, you would have to drive them to court. There would be so many of them. Now we're supposed to be limited to 350 pages, but of course you get permission to put in much bigger bundles and we very often do. And the disclosure requirements they consist of witness statements, forming experts, reports and questionnaires, responses, skeleton arguments and so on. They do not exist in anything like the same way in proceedings in other jurisdictions. So, you know, there is this very big difference which actually uh, has, has caused real difficulties between us, but also has enabled us to learn from each other. And I'll just talk a little bit more about that. If we can have the next slide. Thank you very much. Now, Brexit, you know about Brexit. And of course, you know, we are in a very different position now in England and Wales, in the UK generally. When we were part of the European Union, we were one of two really common law voices at the table. Because nearly every uh, jurisdiction in mainland Europe is a civil law jurisdiction. Ireland is the other common law jurisdiction, relatively small country, relatively new divorce laws, actually, and relatively new laws which are taken to a large extent from the existing English laws. So we were a very important voice at that table. We found it really quite difficult dealing with European instruments, with EU instruments, which essentially are the internal legislation uh, sort of statutes made within the European Union. But being the common law voice at the table meant that we were able to adjust these instruments to some extent to fit our common law system. And also, we didn't have to sign up for all of them. So we have strange systems like we do not apply foreign law, whereas nearly all the civil law jurisdictions will apply foreign law. But that's something that we found very difficult to do. Now, I don't want to be too technical about the um, about, for example, the convention of the 23rd of November 2007 on uh, family maintenance. But it is just worth touching on this. And the reason I want to touch on this is I want to talk a little bit about the importance of the Hague Conference on Private International Law. This is HCCH, called so because of the Hague Conference, Conference AG, so that they use the French as well as the English by way of description. This is an incredibly influential organisation. It's a relatively small organisation. You can't believe it's a small organisation when it has such wide ranging influence. But what we have found in England and actually overall in the UK is that as we have now left Europe as of January of this year, because we finished our transition period of January in this year, we've left the EU, haven't left Europe, I should correct myself. Um, we're no longer a party to any of the instruments that we've been learning over decades to adopt and to get used to. And we are turning to the Hague Conference on Private International Law to in a sense, renew our relationship with them so that we can at least share with uh, the, the sort of harmonization created by various of these uh, instruments, uh, various of these conventions as provided by the Hague 
conference. So we will continue to be linked in respect of international families with EU countries and, of course, with very many other countries throughout the world. The important thing here is that we, over, I suppose it's really the last 30 years, have learnt to a large extent how to adopt common law, civil law elements to our common law system. We have learnt that rules are a good thing. We've learnt that some kind of structure for the way that we practice is really very valuable indeed. Whereas before we were too discretionary, we were using case law ahead of um, statute to too great an extent. And our relationship and our association with the European Union was really very, very valuable for us. Most family lawyers really valued the reciprocity which existed between EU countries when we were members of the EU. They valued the, uh, the harmonization that had grown up over this time. And we are very keen to see that continue. The only way, unless we rejoin the European Union, which is frankly highly unlikely from what one can tell, the only way that we can really continue with this is through the Hague Conference on Private International Law, which has many regulations which are extremely similar to the EU regulations. And in fact, many of the EU regulations were taken from the um, Hague Conference regulations and slightly adapted. So as I say, our relationship with HCCH is now renewed. In fact, the International Academy of Family Lawyers has a particularly close relationship with the Hague Conferences. I don't know whether any of you were at the um, the International Academy of Family Lawyers uh, meeting, which they organised in New Delhi, where we had um, a representative from the Hague Conference, Philip Lotti, who's the first secretary who was talking to us, mainly in terms of 1980 Hague Convention on Child Abduction, which of course is a fascinating topic uh, in the context of um, India and something which uh, I've explored in some detail with many Indian practitioners. But I'm just going slightly off track because I know that I'm concentrating on finances on divorce, but I did just want to stress the importance of the Hague Conference in our future dealings. So can a closer link for civil law and common law systems be achieved? I really hope so, because I think some kind of meeting of the ways is what ultimately is going to be the appropriate way forward. Uh, if we could just go on to the next slide. So we've talked about these differences between common law and civil law systems. And as I've said, I really don't want to say that the common law system is very much better. This cumbersome, clunky system that we have is applied pretty much to every single case. Now, of course, we have systems for dealing with finances on divorce to try to avoid litigation. We have mediation. We have arbitration, although that's really very similar to the court process. We have collaborative law, which has grown up quite well. These are all systems that try to bring these cases to an end more easily. But ultimately, the system is at fault because we do not have enough rules. Will we see further harmonization going forwards? Well, obviously, leaving the EU didn't exactly help us from that point of view. But as long as we can really try to use the Hague Conference on Private International Law to try to assist us to work closely together, that could work pretty well. So we do welcome more certainty, uh, increased understanding and international powers of enforcement. And we are scared 
of the ongoing lack of clarity, which means that it's hard to advise our clients. Misunderstanding of complex laws is a cause of a huge amount of, of, of stress for our clients and indeed for ourselves. I think the public perception is that lawyers welcome complex laws because actually they can make more money out of it. But that's very much a, a false perception. We actually welcome clarity. We want to be in a position to be able to say to our clients, this is the way forward. This is the answer. This is what you should do. And ongoing uncertainty is not good for us and not good for our relationship with our clients. So let's just think, and I'm talking particularly to you as young people and whatever influence you may have in the future, to see whether we can create a bit more of a hybrid between the common law systems and the civil law systems, which I think has already begun. Um, thank you very much indeed. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Well, um, sir, thank you for your uh, presentation. Uh, if if Professor Lars, can I just ask a brief question? Uh, oh, absolutely. Okay. Uh, well, I mean, my question is, since you're a practitioner, it's more oriented to your practice. How do you, in the Indian system, there is a marginalized marginalized view of of uh, prenuptial contracts, right? And how do you as an international practitioner reconcile this when you are dealing with another common law country? Although on principle you share those values, but in a country like India where a prenuptial is looked down upon, looked down upon how do you reconcile the construction in a court uh, wherein you, the judge in itself is against the idea of uh, agreement such as that of a prenuptial? Well, we have to deal with this quite often, but in most civil law jurisdictions that we deal with now, prenuptial agreements are recognised one way or another. They're not binding on the court in most of these jurisdictions, but they are of evidential value. So, for example, I have many cases on with the US and with Australia, uh, with Hong Kong uh, in particular, in terms of common law jurisdictions, where I have got to consider what needs to go into the prenup. In fact, just before I was doing this talk, I was just an email exchange on a prenup I'm doing at the moment, where the parties are both English, but they're quite likely to be going to live in the US relatively shortly. We don't know where they're going to be living. And of course, in the US, each state has a different law and each state has a different attitude towards prenups. In fact, they say that there are 10 what they call community property states in the US. This is not community property in the same of in the way of automatically uh, creating a regime on marriage, but it's where 50 percent of what's been made during the marriage is what they're very likely to order. And so in places in those sort of jurisdictions, then, of course, uh, prenups are very much taken into consideration. So it's quite easy for me even though I don't know which state the parties are going to be living in, our prenup, which is an English one, because that's where they're living at the moment, is done on the basis of trying to make it likely to be relevant for wherever they go. So in fact, what I've done in this case is I've chosen a New York lawyer to give me advice on what she thinks the right clauses should be. So we've amended the clauses they, they have similar concepts like separate property, property which they currently own or property that they will inherit. So the, the fundamental point behind it, which is in this particular case, we're saying everything will be shared during the marriage. But this is the property that must be treated as separate. That's going to be accepted in pretty much every state of the US, which are all common law states apart from Louisiana, which is a civil law state. For a country like India, it's a bit more difficult because we just have to say to the clients, look, do a prenup, do it on the basis of the English rules, 
if you happen to get divorced in India, we'll see what the law looks like at the time. It might be in 10 or 15 years time. Maybe the judge that you get who's dealing with your case will think that actually uh, a prenup is something that is relevant for the purposes of uh, making any financial order. But we can't we can't really do anything for you uh, in the absence of that. Of course, we bring in Indian lawyers for these purposes who can do what they can do to make it as likely to be effective as possible. But you can't achieve the impossible. If an Indian court is unlikely to uh, look favourably on a prenup, then the clients have just got to accept that. We've got to do our best. The important thing is that the clients need to be educated and they need to be talked about the pitfalls. And the, the whole background of prenups is, and you would have seen from what I've just said, that the English court looks at it on the basis of, did the individuals understand at the time that they signed that prenup what it was that they were doing and what it was that they were entering into? And that's fundamentally it. But 15 years ago, Many of our judges would have said, I'm not interested in prenups. I'm going to do what I want to do. That's changed. It may change in India. Just one more question with aligns more uh, acutely to what this course is about on the United Nations and the international system writ large is that I do sense a bit of skepticism. I also sense a bit of uh, glee when you talk about international uh, conventions and specifically the Hague Convention which you touched upon. The whole crux of the Brexit was that we take control back into our hands and we decide we decide on our own what suits the country best. But I also sense that you have some sort of longing for the Hague Convention uh, specifically on child, child rights. Uh, so do you prefer that this, do you prefer a stance wherein you can actually demand for a treaty wherein you dictate the terms? Or are you, as an international practitioner, more in favor of, of an agreement wherein there is consensus writ large? Well, this is a, this is a wide ranging question with potentially a wide ranging answer. But I mean, first of all, um, I think that autonomy is overrated because actually the harmonization is, doesn't mean we have the same laws, not the same substantive laws. It means that we understand the procedure that each country has or each jurisdiction has, and we share the procedure in many cases. That's not giving up our sovereignty. That's not giving up our, our own rights to make laws. This is a sensible way of dealing with matters in the context of international movement of people, whereby for example, in England, we have 600,000 French people living in London. It's France's sixth city. We have, of course, very many people from all sorts of other countries living in England as well. We can't just say, right, we'll do our own thing. We want to have complete control over it. It's much more sensible for us to have a place at the table in the discussion of these international treaties. Now, the Hague, the 1980 Hague Convention on Child Abduction, I think, is a fantastic convention. It, the point about that is that it takes away the discretion of the court to return children to the place where they are habitually resident. And this is right and proper. Um, and, you know, this has been very, very valuable for us because so many people from other countries are living in England and they take the children illegally away back to their country of origin. So what do you do about that? Unless you have a system whereby that country has to send them back, it's, go it's not going to work for the children and it's not going to work for the families. Now, of course, there are going to be exceptions where the children are potentially subject to great harm or where they've been in, a, in another place for over a year, where they're settled and so on. But it's right that this should be a rule. And the countries enter into this rule because they want to do it, because they want to be seen to be cooperating with other jurisdictions. Cooperation is key. And with cooperation comes 
giving up an element of autonomy, but it's well worth it and it's not a big problem because you're not giving up sovereignty. Thank you so much, uh, Sir Longridge. I think uh, that very fine distinction of cooperation and sovereignty that I think in the practical context, a lot of people uh, sometimes are not able to distinguish. I think this distinction uh, we, we, we will carry with ourselves for, uh, for I think, a very long time. Uh, to kind of further the discussion and to add another dynamic, I just wanted your observations. Uh, when it comes to same-sex marriages, uh, what are the, what are the kind of practical difficulties that you uh, have come across? And obviously, the Brexit uh, comes with its own set of challenges. But what are the challenges that you've seen with same-sex marriages uh, in the UK and as well as in the international context? If you could just provide yes. some insight into well, that. My immediate answer to that is there are no issues because same-sex marriage. I mean, obviously, you have an argument about whether there should be same-sex marriage, but that argument didn't last very long because nearly everybody thought it was fine to have same-sex marriage because we already had, of course, the same-sex civil unions. There came a very interesting legal discussion about, well, now that we've got same-sex marriage, should we still have civil unions? Because it's not fair because heterosexual people can't have a civil union. So anyway, that's another story. But we don't have any issues about that, except, of course, that there will be some countries where same-sex marriage is not recognised, uh, in which case they can't deal with it. But within uh, the EU, the only real, I mean, there are a couple of countries that have issues with same-sex marriage, which are basically Poland and Malta. But apart from that, it's been adopted, and it's been adopted in so many places throughout the world, and the US has dealt with it, and so on. We had quite an interesting on this topic actually we had a very interesting talk when we did the new delhi conference to do with the indian anti-sodomy laws and we had a gay lawyer speaking to us about the work that he had done in the supreme court and in other courts in india in a sense to deal with this particular issue which i now believe has changed because this was about five years ago um and so a lot of it is to do with attitudes. The Indian case was a really interesting one. We once had a lecture in the IAFL from a professor of sexuality who had a graph that showed the difference between the laws in each country and the attitudes in each country. And for India, he said, the laws are very strict against same-sex couples, but the people in India are very tolerant of same-sex relationships. So the law is out of kilter with general, with the general opinion, which I suppose is partly because there isn't really a kind of homophobic tradition within Hinduism. It's not really an issue and so on. And it was the British, I think, who brought in the anti-sodomy laws in the first place. I'm slightly getting off the subject in terms of answering your question, but I hope that what I'm saying is of some interest anyway. But the um, uh, same-sex marriage is just it's just uh, a, a something which everybody just deals with as though it's just an everyday fact of life and it's caused really no issues whatsoever in terms of legislation. And even in terms of international recognition, it's quite rare for there to be uh, any issues about it because frankly, if you're a same-sex couple, you don't go and live in Dubai. You just, you know, you've got to be careful a bit where you take up residence. So, so that's why we don't have these practical issues. Thank you so much, the Longridge. I think it has been very, very insightful uh, for uh, budding lawyers and as well as uh, for us to understand these fine distinctions between civil and common law, especially in the area of family law. And considering how niche and uh, interlapping, um, overlapping this area of law is. Um, I think it takes years and years of experience that you have managed to simplify all the complex issues for us. And uh, it's uh, thank you so much again for taking our time out of your busy schedule. Uh, we're really looking forward to once uh, the situation gets better to hosting you at our thriving campus. Uh, it'll be an honor and a pleasure to host you. And uh, thank you once again. We're looking forward to hearing from you and such insightful sessions again in the future. Well, that's, thank you very much, um, Akriti, and I'm very much looking forward to my next trip to India, whenever that may be. <laughs>
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, sir. Grateful. Thanks, thanks, Ankit.